Good morning. I just want to remind the governing board members that we have a short uh, meeting right after, well, not right after, but 10 minutes after this service ends, uh, we will meet in the cafe. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to James chapter 2. going to be reading verses 14 through 19. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, oh, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons, Believe that and shudder. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's powerful. It changes lives. It touches hearts and it challenges us. It convicts us. It does so many things. So, Father, this morning we pray that we would be receptive to the things that you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. What do you think your chances are of going to heaven? Have you ever thought about that? A few years ago, USA Today did a survey on the street asking people what they thought their chances were of going to heaven. One older man answered, my chances are about 50-50. The older I get, the more I think my chances will improve, he said. Another man, a younger man, said, my chances are about 85%. He said, I don't think the entrance exam will be that tough. One woman said, my chances are kind of slim, maybe 50-50. You have to be more than a nice person, but I'm still in the running. Now, if someone were to answer, my chances of going to heaven are 0%, we would wonder what kind of a monster that person is inside. On the other hand, if someone were to say that my chances of going to heaven are 100%, we might think of them as being holier than thou. What about us? What about us? What are our chances of going to heaven? If we were to die this very moment, the answer for all of us here this morning is either 0% or 100%. We are either lost or we are saved. Our faith is either real or it's not real. A truth that James emphasizes in this text and, and that the Word of God teaches throughout is that what we do reveals who we are. James is not speaking simply of beliefs and intentions in general, but it, he is speaking of the foundational belief of saving faith. The genuineness of a profession of faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord is proven more by what a person does than by what he claims. 
Well, let's take a look at point number one. Genuine faith is more than an empty confession. In verse 14, again, we read, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? This person may believe the basic truths of the gospel. This person may believe in such things as the existence of God and accept scripture even as the word of God. This, this person may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. This person may believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again on the third day. The theology of this person is not necessarily in question. The issue is that he has no works. The two questions asked in this verse basically say that faith that is not accompanied by good deeds has no saving value. The questions in this verse set up the hypothetical case of a person who claims to have genuine saving faith. Notice that James does not say that the person actually has faith. The person claims to have faith. The question, can such faith save him? This question, can such faith save him, is structured in the Greek text in such a way that it expects a negative answer. James is asking, this faith can't save him, can it? Faith without works cannot save. It, it takes faith that proves itself in the deeds it produces. It is not speaking of deeds performed to earn merit before God. It is not saying that we can earn our salvation through good deeds. But it is saying that when there is genuine faith present, it will affect a person's behavior. Where there is true salvation, God reaches down and creates in, this, in that soul a desire to forsake sin and live for Jesus. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It does not mean that we are perfect, but there should be some desire inside to forsake sin and live for Christ. When pagans in Ephesus placed their trust in Jesus Christ, they confessed their sins. Those who had practiced magic uh, brought their books together and began to burn them in the sight of everyone. This doesn't mean that new Christians immediately understand the full implications of the gospel and know everything they should do or shouldn't do. These things come with ever-increasing knowledge and awareness as one grows in the knowledge of God's word. But there is an immediate and new spiritual and moral orientation that God gives every child who is born into his family and into his kingdom. No one is saved without becoming a new creation. And by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the new creation produces such righteous works as repentance and, su and submission, uh, obedience, and a love for God and, uh, and a love for fellow believers. Salvation does not produce immediate perfection, 
but it does move people in a new direction. Point number two, genuine faith is more than a false compassion. In verses 16, 15 and 16, we read, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? Now, we ha here we have an illustration of the point being made in verse 14. It is the case of a believer, a brother or a sister in the Lord, who is in dire need. This believer needs food and clothing. The phrase, go, I wish you well, is a modern translation of the original. Um, the original text literally says, go in peace. So instead of, I wish you well, the original text says, go in peace. Uh, go in peace was a standard Hebrew uh, farewell. Uh, the phrase, keep warm and well fed, may be somewhat misleading in this verse. It seems to suggest that the person is already warm and already fed, which is not the case. If we only address a need and do nothing about it, what good is it? Words without action are simply words. In a uh, Peanuts cartoon, it's winter and Charlie Brown and Linus are in the house, you know, keeping nice and warm. But poor Snoopy, he's outside, standing beside his doghouse and from in front of an empty food bowl. Charlie and Linus talk about how sad it is that Snoopy is hungry and cold. They decide they ought to do something about it. And so they walk outside and they say to Snoopy, be of good cheer. But that's all they do. They don't feed him. They don't give him, they don't provide a warm place for him. They simply say, be of good cheer. Now, I'm sure Char Charles Schultz, who was a Christian, had this passage in the book of James in mind when he drew that cartoon. Verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Action is the proper fruit of a living faith. A living faith will surely produce the fruit of good deeds. Therefore, if deeds are lacking, the faith proclaimed by an individual is dead. Notice that the verse does not deny that it is faith. It is faith, but it is not the right kind of faith. It is not a living, saving faith. James compares faith without works to words of compassion without corresponding acts of Compassion. compassion is one of the evidences of someone who has truly been born again, one whose faith is alive and well. The story is told of a Euro European queen several centuries ago who left her coach driver sitting outside during the winter while she went in and attended the theater. The drama was so heart-wrenching that the queen sobbed throughout the entire performance. But when she returned to the carriage and discovered the coach driver had frozen to death, she did not shed a tear. 
she was deeply moved by a fictional tragedy, but completely untouched by a real tragedy, even though she was directly involved and directly responsible. It is amazing that people can become emotionally involved in a movie or a play or a popular song or a television program. They may weep over tragedies and become incensed at, wrong, uh, at wrongs and injustices in these fictional plots. But they may show no concern or compassion for the predicament of a neighbor who is in real need. In our artificial, self-centered world, fantasy often becomes more meaningful than reality. Point number three, genuine faith is more than a shallow conviction. In verse 18, we read that someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds, show me your faith Without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. The entire New Testament teaches that we are saved by faith alone. Paul wrote this in. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. He wrote, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay, in this passage in Ephesians 2, we have three significant uh, prepositions. First of all, we have by grace. Number two, we have through faith. And then number three, we have for good works. The prepositions being by, through, and for. Now, if we get these out of order, we're in trouble. If we think we are saved by works instead of through faith or works, we have a salvation problem. If we think we are saved by good works, we have a salvation problem. But then James comes along and he says, it's not just faith, but faith and works. So who's right? Is Paul right, or is James right? They are both right. They are talking about different things. Paul was speaking out against the problem of legalism. Some of the Jews thought this way, I've got to keep all the Jewish laws and regulations to be a Christian. James, on the other hand, is not dealing with legalism, but he is dealing with laziness. James is addressing those who say, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you believe. That's who James was speaking to. Paul and James are addressing two different audiences. They use the word works in different ways. When Paul uses the word works, he is talking about Jewish laws uh, such as circumcision. When James uses the word works, he's talking about the lifestyle of a Christian. Paul focuses on the root of salvation. And the root is that which happens to us internally. James focuses on the fruit 
of salvation. The fruit of salvation, that which happens on the outside as a result of what has happened on the inside. We are not saved by the works that we do. The works that we do is the result of being saved. Jesus said, by their fruits you will know them. Our behavior is a reflection of what we truly believe. The quotation, you have faith, I have deeds, could be paraphrased to say, one person has faith, another has deeds. And to this, James responds, show me your faith without deeds. James is saying, you say you are a Christian? Prove it. James is saying, let me see your actions. Back up your words. Let me see your actions. Back up your words. Faith is orderless, weightless, and invisible. So anybody can claim to have it. The implication is that faith cannot be demonstrated apart from action. Faith is an attitude of our inner being, and it can only be seen as it influences our actions. Merely professing faith proves nothing. Not everyone who is a professor of Christianity is a possessor of Christianity. Larry Flint, the publisher of Hustler magazine, claimed to be born again. But nothing changed. Former President Jimmy Carter, in his book, Why Not the Best, tells of a turning point in his life. And that turning point came when somebody asked him this question. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That was a turning point for Jimmy Carter. Only action can demonstrate that one's faith is genuine. James goes on to say, I will show you my faith by what I do. Uh, we need to act in our beliefs. Our behavior is a reflection of what we truly believe. It cannot be stressed too often that no one, no one can be saved by works. Salvation is entirely by grace through faith. Again, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. If works could have any part in our salvation, it would no longer be by God's grace. But neither can it be stressed too often that faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action or some kind of fruit, it's dead. You know, we have the fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. If none of the fruit is evident in a person's life, that person may not be saved. Genuine, transforming faith will produce genuine good works. Faith is like calories. You can't see them, but you can sure see the results. You, you can't see faith, but you can see the results. There will be some form of repentance and obedience, submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It will not be perfect obedience, but good works and some fruit will be present. 
one could say that it costs us nothing to become a Christian, but it costs us everything to live as one. Salvation is free, but there is a cost in becoming a disciple of Jesus. Nothing we possess can purchase salvation. And once we are saved, everything that we have belongs to the Lord. It's all his. We're just stewards of that which he has provided for us. That is what lordship means. Those who believe but are not saved have no intention of committing themselves to Christ, uh, his word, or his will. It's really a, a belief that's in their heads, but it's not in their hearts. Some Jews in Jesus, some Jews in James, in James' day had gone from an extreme legalistic Judaism to the opposite extreme of a Christianity that required no works at all. The Jews who were honest realized that they could not possibly keep all the commandments of God or meet his standard of righteousness. The law was a hopelessly demanding burden that they could not possibly carry. Over the centuries, rabbis had added still more burdens in the form of traditions. And as a result, when they heard, when some of the Jews heard the gospel of salvation by grace through faith alone, many Jews were imme immediately attracted to that. Some assumed that this new religion gave everything and demanded nothing. Such people would make a profession of faith in Christ, but with the mistaken notion that because works were not necessary for salvation, they were therefore not necessary for anything. The result in some cases was a non-saving faith and a type of living that differed little from the way they had formerly lived. It may even have led to worse conduct. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. Faithful Jews believed a creed known as the Shema, found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which says here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The writer James commends his Jewish Christian readers for believing that there is one God. This is good. That God is one was a basic truth of Jewish orthodoxy. But accepting this creed is not enough to save a person. To prove this point, James declares that even demons believe the creed. Demon, demons are very much aware that the Bible is God's word. But demons are very much aware that Jesus is God. Demons are very much aware that salvation is by grace through faith. Demons are very much aware that Jesus died and was buried and rose again from the dead to atone for the sins of the world. Demons know quite well that there is a literal heaven and a literal hell. But all of that knowledge cannot save them. Demons know the truth about God the Father Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but they hate it. 
The demons know that there is only one God, and they shudder. The demons tremble with fear, which shows that they truly believe. However, their response is also evidence that their faith is not a saving faith, for they are terrified at the thought of God. Belief has not brought them peace with God. <clears throat> Saving faith, then, is not mere intellectual acceptance of a theological truth. Saving faith goes much deeper, involving the whole inner being of a person and it expresses itself outwardly in a changed life. Shallow conviction is a recognition of certain facts about God and his word without submission to either. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, we have a very sobering, statement by Jesus. And this is what Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He goes on to say, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? or in your name drive out demons and, and perform many miracles. Then Jesus says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I'd like to have the worship team uh, come up at this time. A uh, mirage is an interesting phenomenon. As a kid, I remember traveling with my parents and looking down the highway and seeing that, that shiny spot on the highway, thinking, surely there, there's water setting on the highway. But as you know, the closer you get, eventually it vanishes. It's only a mirage. A mirage does not only occur in the mind of a thirsty wanderer, the scientific reasons have to do with a dense layer of hot air rising from the ground, reflecting the image of distant objects. The problem with a mirage is that it disappears when you come up close to examine it. It was only a reflection. It was not the real thing. For the thirsty traveler, there is no fountain of gushing, cool spring water. There is only more heat, more frustration and despair. And just like mirages that offer empty hope to a desperate traveler, so there is a faith that never delivers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, we read, examine, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. It says, test yourselves. You know, the Coca-Cola company says that they're pop. It's the real thing. It seems if you put the word real in front of anything, it sells better. There are many different religions that claim to be the real thing. Many of these religions offer us religion without a relationship. They offer us a crown without a cross. They they offer us a, a salvation without a savior. They offer us peace without 
the Prince of Peace. They offer us comfort without commitment. There are many religions that offer us faith, but it is not the real thing. This is the real thing. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, it says that he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God, meaning Jesus, does not 